Hello, and welcome to Eastern Roman History. Today, I am joined by Dr. Brian McLaughlin, who wrote his PhD about the third book of John the Sixth Cantacuzanos' history. He has very kindly agreed to discuss this topic with us today. Hello, Brian. Hello. I must correct your pronunciation. It's McLaughlin. But, uh, McLaughlin. It's wow. not always easy to from first. Well, thank you very much. But, uh, I'm, uh, I'm pleased to be here. John the Sixth is one of those very interesting characters from history where not only is he the big personality of the 14th century, but also we have a history written by him of his own times. So with that, and because he was involved in so much, I wanted to ask you quite a lot of questions about John the Sixth and also his history, which you have made the subject of your speciality as a doctor. To start us off, what drew you to do your thesis on the history of John the Sixth? Right, well, it's a good question. Um, I originally became uh, interested in uh, uh, Byzantium, I, I think, as uh, quite a lot of people do, as a, a sort of amateur enthusiast. And I was aware from very early on, I mean, you, you find this a lot when you're reading even relatively uh, popular books, uh, is that you're never very far away from the Greek sources. Often with, you know, uh, citation footnotes dropped in in Greek in the in the texts and so on. And I became aware quite quickly that there was uh, quite a lot of material out there, even the basic uh, historical narrative, uh, which had never been translated. And as I was drawn to reading uh, as many of the Byzantine historians as I could, there were some gaps in there and really I, I wanted to kind of help in filling one of them. So I, I suppose I was quite inspired by similar works like uh, the late Dr. Ruth McCready's work on Acropolites. When I applied to do a PhD, I very definitely wanted to do a translation and commentary on a previously untranslated historical author. Initially, it wasn't necessarily going to be Cantacuzanos. I knew there were some out there and I was quite attracted to uh, Zonaras, but I, mm. I heard unofficially there were a lot of partial uh, translations floating around in academia, even if they hadn't been published. I have actually and, uh, come across a couple. I spoke to um, Thomas Banchich about right. it. He was secretly translating book 13 or something like that. I mean, this is the thing. Frustration, I suppose, to the general reader is that uh, um, there are these um, uh, working texts floating around which don't necessarily see the light of day for the rest of the public. I did, I think, briefly think of doing Gregoras, and I was advised that uh, Gregoras is, shall we say, not a not a beginner's text. Uh, <laughs> okay, it's a very voluminous style. I don't think he's actually quite as bad as Pachymarius, who is usually considered to be one of the most difficult historians to read. But it, so it's actually my supervisor suggested, had you, uh, have you considered Cantacuzanos? And uh, I went away and, and read up on him. And there was an awful lot actually praising the simplicity of his style, which, um, as I, I later discovered, brings obstacles of its own. But I thought that sounded suitable. So uh, <laughs> the rest is history, really. And one PhD later, and we have <laughs> the first 30 chapters with commentary of book three. Yes, book three was really because there have been previously attempts at translating Cantacuzanos by PhD students, and uh, book one was um, tackled by a gentleman I've never managed to track down called uh, Harry Trone back in the 1970s, mm. and book four which was uh, Cantacuzanos' uh, reign, was partly translated by Timothy Miller. And they were both studying uh, under the same supervisor. So there had been previous fragmentary uh, attempts to uh, translate into English. And the main obstacle to this is it's, it's incredibly long, far too long for a PhD thesis if we were going to do the whole work. So uh, uh, I had to find a bit which nobody else had really studied in detail before. And um, as I found out, I mean, the start of book three is, I suppose, quite thin on action and has a lot of speeches and self-justification in it, which made it a, a quite difficult text to approach. It's very rhetorical. But uh, as I discovered, that had um, certain secrets of its own to reveal. 
and was probably uh, more interesting than it first appeared. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. Um, so one one of my questions would be, while you were studying book three, what surprised you the most about the content of it? Because it's mainly about the road to the second Paleologan civil war. Yes, I mean that itself. I mean, given that the the small portion of the the whole work that I've translated, uh, I mean, the, even that is approaching the length of the entire of the first book, and it really is covering just a, a few months in thirteen forty one. So the first thing to say is that this justification uh, of the outbreak of the Second Civil War is incredibly important to Kant Kuznos. Mm. because he spends an immense amount of time and effort on it. Within that, I, I think to an extent it, it shapes the, the work as a whole. I mean, there, there is a danger here in overprivileging the, the part of the text that you know best, but um, so much of uh, Kant Kuznos's life and indeed the late history of the empire really hinges on this event, and that I don't think it's disproportionate that he spends so much time talking about it. Yeah. Now, what I was a bit worried about is that, and you, you will sometimes see sort of sniffy remarks about this, um, and um, Donald Nickel, whom I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about later, is of course the the name associated greatly with Cantacuzanos, often found the rhetorical speeches quite tedious, and you often get these as a sort of byword really for uh, what's uh, bad or unappealing in Byzantine historiography. Uh, these sort of very extended rhetorical passages, but um, given given that I'd committed myself to translating them, I was reading them very closely, and I found really that what I was reading was somewhat at odds with how the period had been reported to me in the more general narratives, including by Nicole. I mean, that and brings me that, on to yeah. my follow-up question, which is, what is the historiography regarding John the Sixth history in this period? Right, yeah, well, I mean, that, that is a, a very useful question. In English, it hasn't been a terribly popular period until recently. Um, I mean, the, the, the main author, um, I suspect you know, most of your audience will have heard of, is Donald Nicol. Um, he wrote the sort of narrative framework for the period, the last centuries of Byzantium, and uh, a dedicated work on John VI, the reluctant emperor, which was really, uh, to an extent, rehashing his much earlier work, which I think was for his own PhD thesis, which was a prosopography of the Cantacuzanoi, but with huge attention given to John VI in particular, because obviously he's got this massive work dedicated to his own life, so um, he's the one we know most about by far. If you go beyond Nicol, I would say Angeliki Leu is always a, a good on this period, her book on Andronicus II. And once you go beyond that, I mean, there are lots of um, scholarly articles and people have used Cantacuzanos as a source, but most of the work is, is uh, in French or German. The, the late period of Byzantium and not generally being so popular, say, until fairly recently in Anglophone academia. Uh, so, I mean, there's Ursula Bosch wrote a, a history of Andronicus the uh, Andronicus the Third uh, in German. And she greatly dislikes Cantacuzanos, but of course has to use him as a source. There is a German translation of the first three books of Cantacuzanos, uh, with a, a promise that the fourth may appear at some point. And um, I believe there's a French translation of the entire work uh, due to be published, which was adapted from uh, notes that um, were found after uh, Guilain's death. He had made a, a translation of most of it. So most of the, but the English historiography has really been dominated by Nicole. Um, other authors, um, say like uh, Mark Parchusis and you know, he's quite well known for his history of the late Byzantine army. I've obviously made a great deal of use of the history as a source, but he's not commenting directly on uh, Cantacuzanos as an author. Just using the material more for what it has to say than. Yes, and, and, and that I think has been the predominant use of it. Um, I think that, I mean, I, I find 
people have occasionally misused it or misunderstood uh, passages that I'm familiar with, partly because there hasn't been a comprehensive study of the entire work. I think it's generally been assumed to be a, a slightly simpler text than it actually is. I, I detail some examples of this in my thesis in that he, he uses things like flashbacks and so on. An awful lot of uh, the points he makes assume that you've read the history in sequence. And of course, most academics, when you're there looking for a, a point to prove a particular argument, are not doing that. <laughs> yeah. yeah a bit um, so it, it, it can messy. sometimes present traps um, for the wary, I think. So before we carry on with talking about the history itself, should we talk a little bit about John? himself. So he rises to prominence in the first Paleologan civil war. What role did he play in that and then afterwards? Obviously the, the question of what exactly John's role is um, is rather influenced by what he wants to tell us. Um, and this of course is a, the central problem of assessing him as a figure in that we have his, his own testimony predominantly but also that of Nicephorus Gregoras. And at the time of the First Civil War, uh, Gregoras was uh, generally a supporter of Kantakuznos, so his betrayal is relatively favourable. On the other hand, um, Gregoras deeply dislikes Andronicus III, so it's a slightly more complicated picture comes out of that. But in terms of his role, he was one of uh, Andronicus III's inner circle, which was really um, John Kantakuznos, Sergianis, um, who later actually rebels against Andronicus III, uh, that's in uh, 1334, uh, and flips sides really during the First Civil War as well, in that he, he uh, goes to rejoin Andronicus II for a period. Theodore uh, Synodenos, who again briefly participates in the Second Civil War, uh, and Alexius Apocafagos. And they're really the, the main uh, trusted confidants of Andronicus III. And to an extent, I mean, all of them are contributing their own resources uh, to helping them. So Cantacuzanos and uh, his mother, who was incredibly wealthy, are helping to finance this war. He's also fighting in the war, and he is one of Andronicus' uh, advisors, and one of his closest advisors, I should say. In terms of how he betrays himself, he always wants to make out that he's extremely reluctant to be participating uh, in such a, a conflict within the Paleologos family, uh, but has been forced into this by the unreasonableness of the elder Andronicus, Andronicus II. And again, there he really tends to try to shift responsibility from even the old emperor himself to his advisors, principally people like Theodore Metahetes who have misled him into making bad decisions and forcing his own grandson to revolt against him. Andronicus and John win the civil war eventually, and then they have their uh, Andronicus' sole reign. Traditionally, his reign is seen as sort of like a partnership between himself and John. So Andronicus is out campaigning and John is reforming various parts of the empire, at least that's how the narrative comes across. How much of this would you say is built up by John in his history? And do you think it's a perception that we should accept or not? I think it's really impossible for us to say how accurate the picture is. And he is obviously very important. He he holds a high title, Megas Domesticos. Um, he is very wealthy. Um, he is obviously uh, a very prominent figure in Constantinople. However, he also has a great interest in making out that he is the preeminent uh, advisor of Andronicus III, uh, because this is the uh, one of the central planks of arguments for his own legitimacy when he later attempts to succeed um, Andronicus or rule the empire, uh, rule the empire after he dies. Um, so he has an interest in in playing it up, and, and as a result, inevitably, Andronicus the Third comes over as quite a thin character because it's really about his relationship to John Cantacuzanos more than it is about him in a sense. Mm. Um, unfortunately, but for different reasons, 
something very similar happens in Gregoras's account of the period, because Gregoras doesn't like Andronicus III, who um, basically ruined his his uh, beloved teacher and mentor, uh, Theodore Metahetes. And of course, Gregoras was a, a loyalist of Andronicus II. He has a lot of interest in making out that Andronicus III is a useless emperor. But <laughs> part of his way of doing that, of course, is praising John Count Cousinos. <laughs> yeah. So. And saying that good good things that happen uh, during Andronicus's reign are due to John Count Cousinos. And bad things are, of course, due to uh, Andronicus III. I mean, whatever people say about uh, the obvious uh, problems about trusting John Cantacuzos' account, any idea that Gregoras is a impartial observer are, are really absurd. I mean, yeah. I've, I've seen passages in which he, he attempts to make out that Andronicus is uh, overbold and reckless and also a henpecked, a henpecked coward at the same time. You know, you can't be, he just dislikes him so much that he kind of kind of yeah. throws the kitchen sink at him in terms of uh, his shortcomings, so rather than building up any sort of persuasive picture of uh, why um, he might be a poor emperor. His record speaks for itself, I think, in that um, given that the empire was probably very nearly destroyed, really, during Andronicus II's reign, particularly during the rampage of the Catalan Grand Company, it, it recovers slightly. He avoids financial crises. Um, he manages to reclaim uh, territories in Greece, um, so uh, Epiros and Thessaly. Uh, he reasserts control of the, the island of Hios, uh, which has an immense revenue. And he starts to build fleets again. The empire seems to actually be becoming more prestigious and uh, prosperous towards the end of his reign. How much of this is down to... Cantacuzanos is hard to tell. I mean, Cantacuzanos definitely campaigns with him and is very closely associated with him in the, on the battlefield and so on. But uh, if you're uncharitable, you could actually see this as Andronicus keeping a potential rival close to him at all times. I say, there's really kind of two ways you can uh, read their relationship. Whatever the, the warmth of it, it's clear that, you know, they were very close. We know almost nothing about John's early life, but he seems to have been brought up uh, in and around the palace uh, and known Andronicus III from very early age. So I think it's fair to say they're close, but um, it's uh, I think Nicol probably goes too far in sort of uh, insinuating really that he's really uh, Andronicus is a cipher for John Cantacuzanos, who is the, uh, the grey eminence behind the throne. Mm. I think he was a, a man with his own own initiative and own policies. Um, although I think, to a great extent, they they shared an, an outlook on uh, what they thought needed to be done. I think I have a similar understanding myself that you know, I think perhaps Andronicus the Third, just on the face of it, comes across as too active to just be a sort of puppet of John. Cantacuzanos. Yes. A lot of Greg Rass's criticisms are about his sort of informality and rashness and so on, uh, which is really, this is really his kind of pitch, is that he was a kind of young, vigorous emperor, uh, emperor who wanted to kind of restore the situation of the empire, which was obviously under a, a, a very poor state towards the end of uh, Andronicus the Second's reign, mm. who was very much a, a palace emperor and an old man. They're sort of polar opposites in that way. Uh, but yes, I, I think it, it's hard for us to see now, uh, because of our historical record, what extent uh, the initiative um, and the, uh, the achievements of Andronicus's reign are down to the emperor himself and, and or down to John Count Cousinos. But uh, I think both his detractor, that is Gregoras, and his friend both have slightly different reasons uh, for sidelining Andronicus in a sense um, and emphasising Cantacuzanos as well. Mm. I think that brings um, us on to um, the death of Andronicus the Third and your the the thirty chapters of Book Three. In that, is it inevitable that there will be civil war after Andronicus the Third? And what picture does John the Sixth paint of this? Right, I, I would say, from my own perspective, that 
Byzantium has a very poor history on regencies, um, and some form of civil war seems to have been more or less inevitable at that point. Um, it's fairly obvious that Kantakuzanos was really trying to take the authority of government into his hands. I, I go on some amount of uh, detail in, in my thesis as to why I, I don't really believe that he wanted to make himself uh, emperor as such, but I think he was happy to wield the authority of an emperor. Mm. I think he knew that uh, proclaiming himself emperor would make life very difficult indeed. Um, and so he really wanted to uh, formalise himself as some sort of regent or uh, father. Of, uh, I think the ob obvious one would have been your know, sort of father of the emperor, make himself guardian of John V, or some sort of similar role, maybe a a co-emperor or something like that. I, I, I don't believe that he ever really wanted to uh, depose um, Andronicus and his bloodline. The problem is with Andronicus's death uh, is that it's fairly obvious that Andronicus III did not intend for Cantacuzanos to succeed him in any meaningful sense, <laughs> because he would have said so, uh, and he doesn't. Um, and we know he doesn't because I'm sure if he had done, Kandakuzanos would have told us so. Mm. We do know that in 13, um, 30, I think it was, when he had a an earlier serious illness and then a miraculous recovery, he did more or less name Kandakuzanos as his heir. Now, some people, some historians have doubted this and saying, you know, that Kandakuzanos is making it up in order to justify his later claim. I don't think that's the case. Uh, I just think that the circumstances in 1330 were very different. Andronicus III was himself a usurper, and there were others within uh, the Paleologos dynasty um, who saw him as an usurper, and probably um, his uncles uh, principally. Uh, there were various attempts to depose him during his reign. And I think really that um, as a way of uh, ensuring that nobody either uh, decided to bump him off during his illness and then claim he had died, or indeed just to um, uh, spite the people who were scheming against him, um, he made a public proclamation that um, if he did unfortunately die at this point, that John Cantacuzanos would succeed him mm. instead, which... Had you know, it, it does have some sort of political value for securing his own position there and creating an interest in in him actually recovering. Yeah, um, have a successor to his legacy of some sort, which his opponents indeed, would yes. have to challenge. Yeah. And he's paying off the friends who actually helped get him on the throne, rather than leaving the succession to the enemies who tried to prevent him. So there's very basic sort of political calculation there. The difference is, of course, is he doesn't have an heir at that point. <laughs> and I think that what's changed by 1341 is he has a, a male heir, and now he doesn't really trust um, anybody to uh, another man, uh, John Cantacuzanos, to take over his authority and not depose his young son, mm. who's only nine at the time. And why doesn't he trust him? Well, we just have to look at how the Paleologos dynasty got into power. Um, <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> a young eight. child opposed by yeah. a much older man. Yes. Exactly. Uh, a, uh, a very capable aristocrat and soldier uh, was made regent of an underaged emperor, and um, it turned out that the underage emperor had a terrible accident and became blinded. Uh, <laughs> And so you, yes. you can imagine why Andronicus III does not say, uh, I am going to give my uh, authority to Cantacuzanos in 1341. Also, of course, in 1341, Cantacuzanos himself has adult sons. And this is a problem that he encounters afterwards, of course, is that they say, well, you know, if, if you're emperor, we should inherit the throne from you. Mm. Uh, and there's no point giving it back to the, uh, the Paleologos. This is really uh, against against natural right uh, and that causes him huge problems during uh, his own reign as emperor uh, the rivalry between John V whom he claims to be intending to give the throne back to uh, and his own sons so we can understand why Andronicus didn't leave authority uh, to Cantacuzanos but he would have faced similar problems with any other candidate as well so, mm. 
So what he actually does is make uh, the Patriarch Calicas guardian of the young emperor, John V. Again, this resembles really what happened with the, the Lascarin dynasty, who uh, made um, uh, their last heir into uh, the ward of the Patriarch. Uh, he didn't protect him. Uh, because ultimately, you know, uh, uh, the Patriarch doesn't have a great deal of military force at his disposal. He does that, but he also clearly leaves his sovereignty to his wife, uh, Anna of Savoy. Uh, again, there are problems with Anna of Savoy as a potential ruler. But firstly, she's from Savoy, so she doesn't really have that great aristocratic network of her own, her own relatives, um, who could back her up very easily. And there might be some nativist feeling against her, uh, which you do see expressions of in Gregoras, if, if not in Cantacuzanos. Mm. Still this so, anti-Latin sentiment coming through. Social contention between pro and anti-Latin from sort of arises in from the First Crusade onwards. Yes, they're, yeah. they're not really hard factions, I would say, at this point. Um, again, it flares up later with the attempt at church union, there are quite a few Latins around Andronicus III's court. He seems quite happy with some of the, the Latin knights who uh, accompanied uh, his wife from Savoy. And of course, you actually have one branch of the uh, Paleologos dynasty ruling uh, in Montferrat. Uh, Montferrat. So there is a tie there. So he, he, it's not, it's obviously in sort of pro and anti Latin factions as at other points in Byzantine history. But yes, I mean, there might be some resentment there. But as I say, it, 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 it means she's sort of cut out of uh, a lot of the aristocratic politics uh, that would be going on underneath what we say at the imperial court. So she's in a fairly isolated position. The obvious uh, attempt, I think, really on, on her behalf and that the patriarch is to create some sort of general regency council Again, these never work in Byzantium. <laughs> uh, no. The whole system is geared around really having one person as the uh, at least a nominal head of government. Oh. And um, it, it's very obvious that um, uh, Cantacuzanos thinks that should be him and that there's, there's quite a strong faction that thinks it should be him <laughs> as well. <laughs> the so-called Cantacuzanists. Yes. Um, I, I, I think really the... What comes out between the lines in Cantacuzanos' history is that the Byzantine aristocracy likes a winner. When he seems to be ascendant, um, a lot of people want him to be emperor. When he seems to be uh, on the back front, nobody wants to know him. <laughs> <laughs> and there's not a very consistent Cantacuzanist faction. Uh, there are individuals who remain very loyal to him, but uh, it's noticeable in uh, after things start to go wrong at the start of the civil war for him, that most of them deserve, even even some very close friends. So there's a great deal of opportunism there. So, so yeah. for the Second Paleologan Civil War, what resources did John VI actually have to fight it? Because, as you say, he was a very wealthy man. Yes, um, very very little. I mean. Uh, read some accounts where he's kind of accused of really going away to Didymoticon and taking the army uh, as a, a way of coming back and conquering Constantinople. Uh, this is ridiculous. If you're going to launch a coup and seize control of the government, you, you do it by staying in the capital, not by moving outside it. He's obviously caught on the back front for the uh, civil war. So he starts off in the city of Didymoticon. He has got what he claims is the, the largest part of the mercenaries um, serving in the Byzantine army and most of the best units with him. Uh, so he's not without resources because this is because he was about to launch a military campaign. However, um, all of his friends in the capital were immediately rounded up and arrested, including his mother, and most of his wealth, which is there, is confiscated. And he makes this point himself at uh, various points that if he was planning to seize the throne, he would have hardly left all of his uh, his money lying around in Constantinople. He starts off with a strong military force, but very little in the way of planning and is alienated, I suppose, from uh, a certain amount of his wealth um, and Various members of his family, including his uh, youngest son, are essentially hostages in Constantinople. I think his main resource is his silver tongue, uh, but that doesn't work very well at the start of the 
the war either. I mean, he, he, he obviously attempts various negotiations which are all rejected. So he decides to march on the capital in the process of that. Most of his army ends up deserting. The cities which he probably expected to come over to him and welcome him don't. He's really outmanoeuvred by the regency government and presumably uh, Alexis Apokafkas in that who have him declared an outlaw really before he really gets moving and trying to mobilise support. And the fact is that um, there aren't any armies in the Balkans that are capable of storming the Theodosian walls. Uh, Kantakuzanos, even if he'd got to the capital, couldn't really have done much other than camp outside it and wait for someone to open the gates, which is ultimately what happens. Later on, I mean, the, the, you know, Stephen Duchan has no chance of taking Constantinople. Uh, eventually, when Constantinople falls, it falls to a much larger Ottoman army <laughs> than exists in the 1340s. Mm. Um, and nobody is going to be taking Constantinople by storm. So he's in a very bad position. Really, as I say, he has to rely on people within Constantinople um, taking his cause, and they're very efficient at rounding them up. So he starts in quite a bad position. Now, Andronicus III overcame this, partly because, obviously, he could claim to have been a legitimate heir to the throne, um, and thus people were more likely to side with him, uh, and against a very elderly emperor who obviously wasn't going to be around for very long. But he did it really by just seizing um, control of everywhere outside Constantinople, and then saying, well, <laughs> you know, uh, you can stay in the, stay in the city, uh, but what revenues, what empire do you really have? And I think that's really what John the Sixth was going to attempt to do. Uh, but most of the cities revolt against him. Basically, Thrace is very hostile, even by the winter of 1341. He, he can only control areas where he has a strong garrison, which very quickly means Didymoticon. <laughs> yes. So really march to the, the west, where yeah. he's got more allies in Macedonia and Thessaly, but he, he's already lost the race by that point. Uh, again, reading between the lines, I, I think he's really struggling to know what to do at that point. Which could kind of explain why he goes to Serbia and uh, the aged Turks and so on. Right. Now, I mean, this is interesting because, I mean, his, part of his justification for turning to the Turks is that the Regency government did it first, which they possibly did. Uh, we know from Gregoras that he wrote to the Bulgarian emperor, um, but was rejected. Uh, the Bulgarians actually back the Regency. They don't help very much, and they, they do get some cities for their trouble. And so really, um, he's left with turning to uh, Stephen de Chan, whom... He attempts to convince the reader he didn't really offer Duchamp anything other than other than his goodwill. Duchamp was so swayed by his persuasiveness and uh, the prestige of the Empire of the Romans, and, and also his wife, who is apparently very pro cantacuzan and asks that he just to kind of agrees really to help him out of the goodness of his heart, and, <laughs> mm. which I don't, I don't think we really need to believe. I mean, he, he probably did break the agreement and take rather more than he was promised, but he was probably promised uh, something, something that Cantacuzanos doesn't want to tell us, which would have been territories in Macedonia. He turns to Duchamp, uh, say Duchamp kind of keeps him in contention, but isn't really interested, I think, in putting him on the throne, uh, rather than what he can get out of this for himself. Yeah, conquering Macedonia. <laughs> um, and so he he turns first to uh, Umur of Aden, who, I mean, forget the Ottomans, Umur is actually, uh, at this time, regarded as the most powerful of the, the Turkish Emirs in Anatolia, and is actually quite famous in the West as well. He's the kind of great, great pirate and terror of the Aegean, and he, and he does indeed seem to get on with Cantacuzanos very well. During the course of the Civil War, of course, there is a, uh, a matter of a small uh, Latin crusade which is launched against Umur, which then ties him up defending Smyrna, which is his capital and main port. So John then turns to the, the Ottomans, who have actually been are in an interesting position at this point because um, they don't really have much in the way of naval resources. So he probably thought that by shipping them over and shipping them back again, he could control them to a greater degree than turned out to be the case. But really, between these two Turkish factions, um, he really engages in a, a war of attrition and property destruction across Thrace until really everything has been trashed and um, uh, 
eventually the, the few Regency loyalists left in Constantinople are just really wanting to make everything stop. But he still can't take the city directly. He can't take it by force. Yeah. With the Civil War, at the beginning of Book 3, John VI says um, that it was the bitterest civil war of the Romans against each other in memory that erupted which overturned and ruined nearly everything and proved that the prosperity and greatness of the Roman Empire had reached its weakest point. Do you agree with what John has to say about the Civil War? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think at this point is really when uh, Byzantium becomes uh, irrecoverable. Now, if you read the earlier books of his history, as I say, there are there are signs that the empire is really beginning to uh, regain stability. It's lost Asia Minor, uh, it's lost Anatolia, but uh, its position on uh, in Greece is actually strengthening. Its position in the Aegean, so long as it has the alliance with Emir, um, is actually strengthening as well. You even have uh, panicked letters sent from Rhodes to the Pope saying that, you know, Andronicus is going to attempt to invade Rhodes, which there's no evidence he ever really seriously considered the idea. But just the the very fact that uh, uh, the Knight Hospital are were, were seeing him as a threat was showing that the, the Empire's prestige and power were recovering, I mm-hmm. think. And we also have this story, which uh, I think is probably um, true, that uh, the Peloponnese... Uh, was actually offering to submit to Andronicus just before he died, which again would have, uh, uh, I mean, Cantacuzanos makes a big speech about this, which is closest really to a sort of imperial manifesto that he gives, saying that this would have really reunited nearly all of Greece under the control of Constantinople, apart from Athens, which was occupied by the, the Catalan Grand Company still. And he points out that they would have been heavily outnumbered and forced to submit as well. So this is this is sort of um, kind of hope that suddenly you know things are going to come back together. And I, I think had they managed to assert control over Greece effectively, uh, it would have probably made the empire the most powerful of the Balkan states. Hmm. None of the, the triad of uh, Serbia, Bulgaria and Byzantium were really strong enough to overcome the other in this period. But Serbia is uh, obviously increasing in military strength, uh, partly because of its uh, um, its economy is buoyed up by um, silver mines. Bulgaria is probably the weakest and uh, um, uh, Byzantium's position is uncertain. Uh, I think it would have arguably become the strongest of the Balkan states had it managed to to pull off the the reunification of Greece with Constantinople. So all of this seems like it might be about to happen at the end of Andronicus III's reign. Uh, We don't know if it would have done, but it is possible that it could have done. And all of this falls apart the second the Civil War starts. There's no question of Cantacuzanos taking up the... um, the offered submission of the the Latin states and the Peloponnese. And um, most of the new territories in Thessaly and Epiros, although they remain personally quite loyal to Cantacuzanos, and he he does exercise uh, at least nominal authority over them during the war, uh, they've become very vulnerable uh, to the Serbians, who overrun them really at the start of uh, John VI's reign proper in the 1350s. He ends up really gifting Macedonia to uh, Stephen de Shan, apart from Thessaloniki. But of course, Thessaloniki is occupied by this revolutionary uh, regime, the Zealots. Eventually, they reassert control over that. But again, most of the empire's territory is uh, is lost, really. Probably about 50% of it, uh, should we say, is lost because of this war. Second, the war ends, uh, the Black Death strikes. You've got an already impoverished population because of all the uh, devastation and looting during the war. Then you probably have about a third of the population dying. It's ruined. And that point really, I mean, although Byzantium isn't immediately becoming a vassal of any other power, uh, because none of them are quite strong enough yet, it's really not got the strength to assert itself against anybody else. And this comes across really, I think, quite pitifully in, in John VI's own reign. I mean, he fights wars with the Serbs, he fights Genoese, uh, he fights the Bulgarians, and really 
he achieves very localized successes occasionally, which he makes a big deal about, and then loses them afterwards. But I mean, he, he's fighting to attempt to attempt to regain things that are lost during the Civil War. It ruins the economy. Uh, uh, the population uh, must have decreased severely from the fighting and from the the slaving um, of the mainly Cantacuzos' as Turkish allies. The territories which have just been stitched back together sort of splinter off again. They don't come back from this. In fact, after Cantacuzos leaves the throne, most of Thrace is then lost and you have the, the kind of pitiful final stage of Byzantium where it's a, a few isolated enclaves and a bit of uh, the Peloponnese. Mm. So, uh, yeah, so I mean, I think it's fair to say that it, it really ruins any prospects of it remaining as an independent uh, state at that point. Yeah. So we've talked a bit about John's role in affairs. Let's return to his history again. So why do you think that John chose 1320 to 1364 for the scope of his history? Right. Um, I would say very simply because his history is really telling the story of the conflict between the uh, the Cantacuzini and the Paleologi, starting with uh, his own involvement in um, Andronicus III's uh, revolt against his grandfather, so 1320. The detailed body of his history ends in 1356, when his own son Matthew Cantacuzinos lays down his claim to the throne, uh, really is defeated by John V. The very final event in it, which is the um, the reappointment of um, Philotheos as uh, patriarch, is really just the closing act of that, um, because he'd previously been uh, deposed by John V for um, crowning Matthew Cantacuzinos. And so um, his uh, reappointment as patriarch really is a sort of conciliatory sign by um, John V that the civil wars are over, his position feels secure. And um, uh, and that's really the point at which Cantacuzinos um, lays down his pen. What about the opponents of Cantacuzinos, um, Anna Apocorcus and John Calacas. How are they portrayed by John? How does that compare with what Greg Rass has to say? Do you believe John when he says that it was all Apocorcus's fault? Right. Um, as, uh, as I think, uh, I hope comes out fairly strongly in my thesis, that I, no, not really. Um, I think that Apocorcus was a very convenient scapegoat, um, partly because he doesn't live to see the end of the Civil War, and he is indeed from a fairly minor family, so he doesn't have a, uh, a powerful clan behind him who are, are going to take uh, umbrage. Umbrage, yeah. yes, uh, offence at besmirching his memory. I think that Mancantacuznos um, exaggerates really um, uh, his role. I mean, he, he's obviously very prominent and. This, but he, he, he both kind of diminishes Apocafagus's importance, I think, within the government of Andronicus III and exaggerates his responsibility for the war. Let's say that there's a very obvious mechanism which was going to bring the Empress and Cantacuzinos into conflict, which is um, she is very concerned that her son, John V, succeeds her husband, Andronicus III, on the throne. Now, he can't do at the start of the Civil War, because he is nine years old. But as I was talking about earlier, uh, John Cantacuzinos, as a, a man in the prime of his life, uh, very able and with his own sons, um, she doesn't really want to give him sole authority over everything either, uh, lest he do a Michael VIII. Uh, he never mentions what Michael VIII did, by the way, but I'm sure everybody knew. And Calacas actually has quite a strong claim um, for being involved in the government, which he is meant to be looking after the interests of John V. Now, uh, I, I'm sure that these people probably could have worked out a better way of doing this than the one they did, which was having a incredibly destructive civil war. But there is obviously a basic conflict of interests between them. Now, one of the 
obvious ways to actually solve this was uh, the expedient, um, which is hit on as a sort of uh, reconciliation after the war, which is to marry one of Cantacuzinos' daughters to John V, because he's very unlikely to say he displays his own son-in-law. And one of the most surprising things I, I found really whilst I was translating this part of the history is that Cantacuzinos says that this was offered to him in 1341. If you read Nicol, he says the opposite. He says that Cantacuznos suggested that um, there would be a, a marriage with uh, John V and was rejected by the empress. Now, Cantacuznos himself says precisely the opposite. Uh, basically, he, he, he sort of makes an excuse and says, we, we must think about this a bit later. Okay. And <laughs> to, to me, this, this seems like a very critical episode because mm. uh, given saying about what Anna's concerns would be to protect her son, it's like, why is this man refusing? <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, Kant Guzman is aware of this because when the conspiracy is formed against him, this is one of the arguments which is put into the mouth of uh, Andronicus Sassanis, which is Kant Guzman's own father-in-law, <laughs> uh, saying that, why is this man refused to marry his daughter to your, to your son, the emperor, unless he's planning to kill you all? <laughs> and he never really answers that question directly. I think reading between the lines, uh, again, it's actually because he's worried about other prominent figures in the empire revolting if he does this without talking to them first. He receives a, uh, 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 an embassy from the, the Western governor as well as he is in uh, Didymoticon, who say, you know, they, they greet him, they attempt to greet him as emperor and pledge their loyalty to him, but they also say, don't do anything before we've had a chance to talk to you. <laughs> Because really, they want buying off uh, to have their cooperation. I think, really, what's going on, the dirty secret in the history, is Kent Kuznos's, uh military expedition, which is launching when the Civil War breaks out, is really just a, uh, um, a pretense to take him into Macedonia. He's meant to be fighting the Albanians during winter. I mean, winter is a... He has reasons for why he wants to attack them in winter, but it's a very unusual time to launch a military campaign. I think it's really to take him out there so he can talk to uh, Synodenos, who's in, in charge of Thessaloniki, and the governors of Thessaly and Epiros and uh, other cities like this, because if he doesn't promise them things and get them to buy into him being in control, uh, they might equally defect to Stephen Duchamp, or they might try to seize the throne for themselves. Mm. So I, I, I don't think he was, indeed, because there's nothing in any of his subsequent actions or, or words, uh, of course, uh, to imply that he was really implying, intending to murder John V and uh, seize the throne in that way. I think he knows that that would have caused a world yeah. of pain. For a long time, Michael VIII had uh, awful trouble because he seized the throne in that way. But obviously... There is this allegation there against him. So an awful lot of what he's saying is, is trying to disprove this and proving that he had the best interests of John V and his mother at heart. It is not just an apology for himself, it's an apology for her. And again, you wouldn't know that. Uh, I mean, Gregorax hates the Empress, and so there's an awful lot of negative commentary on her. But uh, again, I think reading the Nicol, you wouldn't really... Uh, I've grasped the fact that he, he spends a lot of time in the history standing up for the emperors. So he's trying to rhetorically separate her from the patriarch. Now, he can't attack the patriarch so directly because the patriarch is the head of the church. Um, and there were loyalist bishops even after Calacas was deposed. And I think reopening old wounds about Calacas and the, uh, and the, the Palamas controversy, which he gets... Um, so strongly associated with, would have also been uh, politically inexpedient in the 1360s when he writes his history. However, Alexius Kapkafkas has been dead for 20 years, so um, everything can be his fault. The other reason that Kapkafkas comes out of this so badly is, of course, that um, he did have the qualities needed to be the ruler of the emperor, empire, if not necessarily the emperor, in his own right. He's not a churchman. He's not a woman, like <laughs> the, the other two major members of the Regency. And he was a close friend of Andronicus III. And an awful lot of what Cantacuzinus says is trying to convince us that Andronicus III hated him, which is ridiculous because he appointed him to be in charge of the treasury. <laughs>
And in fact, when he was away on military campaigns with John Katakousinos, Alexius Abukafkos was usually in the capital running the government. Now, Katakousinos tells us that Abukafkos was almost like this afterthought into the uh, conspiracy launched by Andronicus III, and he wasn't there at the outset, and and really, he was just a hanger-on of Sergianis. He's not a political power in his own right. But actually, Gregoras uh, has them all in it together from the outset. So I think really that, um, I mean, we don't have any major positive testimony left about Apocafcus. But I, I think he was actually a, a far more powerful figure in his own right. Kantakusnos tries to make out that everything that um, he did in government was really deputised to him by Kantakusnos. Mm. Not by the emperor, but by Kantakusnos. So really he's uh, this rogue servant. I think in reality his status was actually, he probably wasn't as prominent as Kantakusnos, but he was a lot more on an equal footing with him. And this is why he was so influential in Constantinople, uh, and probably why um, he he saw that uh, he had a, a right to lead a regency government uh, as much as Kant Kuznos did. So there was a bit of ambition there from both of them, in a way. Yes, uh, and they were both very able men. I mean, um, in both Kant Kuznos and Gregoras's testimony, in both of them say Apocafcus is evil and a liar and and so on, but they admit that he was an extremely intelligent and able man. Mm, except when it comes to inspecting prisons. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, not, not his brightest move. Uh, but uh, I mean, this is an amazing incident just before the uh, emperor dies, which Apocafcus is, is raised Manchester, he seems to be trying to re-establish the Byzantine navy. There isn't a regular navy at this point. There are just fleets raised when necessary. But he actually seems to have been able to afford, and this is no mean feat because it's ruinously expensive, to stage regular patrols of the Aegean. And he actually leads a, a successful battle against uh, one of the Turkish uh, emirates. We don't know which one and defeats them, which Count Kuznas tries to, you know, mock this idea that, I mean, really, Ab Kafka's his history is a pen pusher. He wasn't raised in the aristocracy and he, as a soldier, uh, but he seems to do quite well at it. And again, and in the early years of the Civil War, I mean, he, he manages to move faster and outmaneuver Count Kuznas at every turn in 1341-2. He is a genuinely very capable man. It's probably likely that, yes, he, he thought that he had as much of a, a reason to... Uh, be leading the government as um, Kantakuznos did or, or try his arm to. So much of the focus in Kantakuznos' work is denigrating Abba Kafka, so, you know, this is insignificant and uh, unpleasant individual that nobody likes, uh, which I suspect was untrue. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he's not of the highest aristocracy, but uh, you would think he was almost a gutter snipe the way Kant Kuznos talks about him. He also tries to subordinate him and make out that he's sort of really a servant of Kant Kuznos and not a servant of the emperor. And he ties himself into a lot of not doing this because the only way really uh, to take Kant Kuznos's testimony at face value is to assume that the man was almost terminally naive and was constantly... Giving uh, Apocafcus positions, being betrayed by him, then Apocafcus would say sorry, and then he would give him a, a more important position. And then, he, would you believe it, he would get betrayed again. Um, Apocafcus would say sorry, and Cantacus would mm. go, oh, well, okay, don't betray me again this time. Um, yes. And then, would you believe it, uh, he gets betrayed again. And I, I cannot believe for a second. <laughs> that this it would be a bit of a personality switch around for John Cantacusinos, because... If you accept what he's saying, he's basically a gullible idiot when it comes to judging people's personalities, but also a very intelligent theologian and very yes. capable administrator and general and so forth. So is he really that stupid or is he just sort of playing it away? And, and this view is more or less accepted uh, by Nicol, who says that you know he, he's, he's got a, a major problem with judging other people's character. Um, mm. and, and really, I, I think that it, it's really more of an absurd uh, pretense to avoid admitting that Abba Kafkas had almost as good a claim 
as he did. Kant Kuznos has some sort of blood relationship with the Paleologos family. There is a prostagma by Metros III that we have where he refers to him with the name of Paleologos. However, John doesn't use uh, the name Paleologos when he's governing. Abkafkos, of course, doesn't have any of that. Uh, um, Sorry, Brian, we're losing you a bit over here. From when you're using wireless, I think. Oh, there we are. We've got you back. <laughs> we'll just pretend that we all heard everything you can hear. just said. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> a very interesting point. Yeah. Never mind. And so, as I think I've now uh, completely explained why the Civil War happened, uh, we can move on. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Zooming out a little bit, what do you think? Kantakuznos and his history tells us about usurpation and rebellion in the Paleologan Empire, if you want to call it that. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> I like the um, short and snappy answer. <laughs> well, I think something that comes out of which is quite interesting, maybe in comparison to earlier in Byzantine history, is that the blood claim of the Paleologos family is very strong, mm. um, and that this is really accepted. It's not. Uh, it's not easy to be an usurper from outside the dynasty, and of course, this. I mean, Kandakuznos is the only one who succeeds. Um, most usurpation in the late period goes on from within the Paleologos family. Uh, and of course, it's actually Andronicus III who's responsible for starting them. So there's a very strong uh, dynastic claim, which is respected, and it's respected by John VI during, uh, during his reign. Even when he is acclaimed as emperor, he has uh, the Emperor Anna and the Emperor John V proclaimed before himself. So even his claim... Uh, as an effective usurper, is to be representing the legitimate bloodline and its interests. Almost a little bit like usurpation in the 10th century, where the, yes. the Macedonian dynasty is the imperial dynasty, and if you're a usurper, you have to accommodate that. Yes, that, that's a good parallel, and I, I think had Cantacuzanos been successful in, say, pulling that off in the way that uh, Nikiforis Phocas or uh, John Simiskis was, the empire might have been in a, a much happier place. But obviously his, his attempt to really rule in the name of John V was um, constantly opposed first by uh, the regency in Constantinople, led at the very least nominally by the empress, and uh, later, of course, by John V himself, who really, from the point at which he's old enough to be able to uh, start asserting his interest directly, is unrelentingly hostile <laughs> to uh, the claims of Matthew Cantacuzanos and, and to John Cantacuzanos. Uh, and ultimately, of course, he, he succeeds in uh, displacing him. I, I mean, I could sarcastically add that's about the only thing he ever is terribly successful <laughs> But, you know, do, share that uh, he's very he's very persistent and he, he does he does win through uh, mm. 1354 so. my last question would be how did you find translating and reading the history and is it a a book that you found was interesting to read and had merits in its own right yes i mean i i will i will admit i find it difficult to read um, <laughs> uh, this is because I, I, I came to uh, um, a reading Greek uh, later in life than I think uh, most people who attempt projects like this. And I would say that I'm firstly a historian and, and very much lower down the list a linguist. Um, and also it takes quite a long time to just get used to the style of any particular given Byzantine author and their use of vocabulary. I mean, it's slightly different now, but I mean, there wasn't even a Byzantine dictionary as such when I started. So, you know, we, even even the terms in which they are a meaning individual words is open to um, interpretation at times. So it was, it was quite difficult from that. And actually some of the simplicity, which I referred to earlier, and that is 
taken as a hallmark of his style actually makes it more difficult. I mean, uh, there are passages where, I mean, for some reason he particularly dislikes using people's names. You just end up with pages and pages uh, of discussion between uh, Aftos and Aftu. Uh, <laughs> and at times it can be genuinely difficult to work out who's actually speaking. There isn't punctuation in terms of speech marks and uh, there are some in the edition which have been added but at various points uh, I think uh, the, the, even the poor editor has given up and um, trying to work out because he, he switches between say reported and uh, direct speech almost within the same sentence at times and <laughs> it can get a little bit baffling like that. So uh, it wasn't that straightforward I suppose. In terms of its literary merits, um, yes, um, it's, it's written, uh, I mean, it doesn't necessarily come over by translation because I, I did a probably over-literal translation of it for a, a sort of a casual reader, but uh, right down to maintaining the sentence structure, which is why, you know, I think the first sentence in uh, book three is about 20, 20 lines long. It can get quite uh, involved like that, but I think in terms of its uh, uh, literary value, it, it's um, it's very strong. I mean, at times there are very dramatic and the scenes you can really picture them. The conspirators um, uh, warping the the empress from her previous appreciation of Cantacuzanos into pronouncing him an outlaw, for instance, is very well done. It's a series of chapters in which her, her will is slowly broken down and she led to mistrust what she previously thought of him and changed to seeing him as a threat, which she does very reluctantly. And uh, th this is done, I think, with a great deal of um, psychological insight. It's, it's almost, um, you know, the, the, the character of um, Abba Kafkas is almost Shakespearean. He's an Iago, he's, he's an expert manipulator. So it is actually quite a, an interesting literary work in its own right. It hasn't really been studied that much as such in that way, but more as a historical source, although uh, Alexander Kajdan, for instance, referred to it as a monument of um, uh, Byzantine literature. He did a very interesting analysis of it. And uh, the whole thing is, is told in the third person. I mean, well, it's uh, easy. Well, no, no. <laughs> well, well, it is like Caesar in that sense, yes. He's, he's constantly referring to the Emperor Cantacuzanos, but uh, he claims to be a letter written by this character called uh, Christodoulos. So you, know, you would assume a monk, but that wasn't Cantacuzanos' monastic name either. Um, so he just sort of invents this little persona who was apparently there and witnessed everything as it happened and was involved at all of these great moments. Yes, uh, able to teleport but, uh, from one end of the empire to the other. It is implied, uh, implied that he was very close to Conrad Kuznos, uh, but you're just left sort of assuming it isn't really him. I think there's one point in the entire work, I forget where now, where he accidentally slips into first person when talking about himself, ah. which is it's remarkable level of discipline, <laughs> given how long it is, and the, the mm. fact that you know he is the the protagonist really of the in, the entire thing, and he really once sort of uh, accidentally slips and and says, "I did this," rather than he did this. Must have been quite a good uh, self editor in that respect. It's like, yes, I mean, because uh, I know it's very, it's like a thousand pages or something. In yes, yes, in, it, uh, it, it is the very very long. <laughs> Our most up-to-date edition, which is over 150 years old. <laughs> there, there is a new one due to be published soon. Mm. I, I believe it's actually complete, but it hasn't actually uh, been published in uh, CFHB. So there will be a new edition on its way. Okay. It's an extremely long work, and the, the interesting thing is as well, it, it is very much a very controlled edifice subordinate to his argumentative purposes. Um, a lot of Byzantine histories really start at a particular point, say, you know, start an imperial reign and just carry on with a, what happened in, a, a, in, in an analytic fashion, really, either year by year or reign by reign, and say this is what happened, and then they sort of come to a stop. But um, everything in Cantacuzanos is really uh, dedicated to explaining why the good things that happened in his life were were good and right, and the bad things that happened were weren't really his fault, uh, <laughs> and he was forced into it by other people. And as I say, the whole thing really is a history of the descent, I think, between the two families, if we put it that way, or within the Paleologos family. I think we, if we can 
guess at what the purpose of the work was. It certainly wasn't written for a mass audience. Uh, it really is a sort of attempted reconciliation, I think, because because of the marriage of uh, Helene uh, Cantacuzini to John V, the bloodlines have merged. All future emperors are, are in fact, a descendant of John Cantacuzinos, and his work is really explaining how this conflict within the family started and and why we should now consider it over and uh, you know never get into this terrible situation again uh, and that, that's my personal theory for what the purpose of the work is mm. well, shame andronicus the fourth did not read it <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, yeah. I mean, we have to admit it, it wasn't terribly successful if that was its goal i do take your point i think it's a very good one one thing which is really disappeared in this period is the concept of executing or blinding uh, members of the aristocracy for political crimes. It doesn't really happen. There may be loss of property, there may be imprisonment. I mean, Kent Kuzanos, um appraises John V for not blinding uh, Matthew when he falls into his hands. Maybe he did consider it as a way of stopping any further dissent, but it um, really seems to have stopped with Michael VIII. It's not necessarily very clear why, but um, he, when Andronicus III is uh, punishing people who revolt against him, he doesn't have them executed either. This is a very different sort of culture uh, around usurpation and so on within the aristocracy than in earlier periods where you would expect something like this to end with a, a bloodbath, really or at least a, a blinding and retirement to a monastery. But uh, Kantakuznos continues to sign himself as Vasilevs for the rest of his life. He signs himself as emperor and monk, uh, and one must assume that John V remained happy about that. Yes. Emperor, retired. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. The whole concept of retired emperor is <laughs> mm. really something that he invents. He invents a lot of things. I mean, the splitting the empire up between members of the imperial family, really, to stop them arguing, is Kantakuznos' innovation as well. Of course, we know that it doesn't actually work, but it does become an established practice, really, for the, the, the next century. Well, thank you very much, Brian. I really appreciate you coming on here and talking about the incredibly interesting story of John VI of Kantakuznos. Yeah, is uh, there anything you would like to promote or uh, suggest for uh, further reading for our audience? Uh, my thesis is available for download from Royal Holloway's um, internet repository. Uh, if anybody wants to read it about any of my points in more detail. Other than that, I, I would really just say it's a fascinating uh, part of Byzantine history and uh, um, I recommend it to anybody to take an interest in. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your interest. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, I've enjoyed it. Well, this has been a fantastic discussion. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And this has been Eastern Roman History.